Thanks, everyone. Um, so we're in the smaller breakout session, and we're going to be talking about hip injuries in hockey. And we actually, we were worried that it was just going to be the three of us in this room, because yeah, yeah, yeah. more people would probably be worried about the running. <laughs> um, so it's a pretty, this is a pretty big topic, and it doesn't apply just to, uh, to hockey. Uh, you know, that being said, we're, just, we're talking about hip injuries in general. You heard a lot about what was going on with dance, and a lot of what goes on in dance is really applicable to what goes on in hockey and any other sport that requires the hip, which is pretty much every sport. The biggest thing I think that, you know, that we can do for prevention of hip injuries is to be aware of, you know, it, it, there's, no, there's no one size fits all. You want to individualize, you want to assess your athletes and then come up with a treatment program or a plan for each individual athlete because everyone is different. So today, what we're going to start off with really briefly is talking about hip injuries and the anatomy of the hip and then we'll go into a live demonstration of things that you can apply in your own practice, things that you can do, uh, which we thought would be, would be really helpful um, uh, uh, for you all today. So hip injuries, uh, they're on the rise. The significant portion of hip injuries are actually um, muscular injuries, so adductor strains and um, psoas injuries. Those are the most common, uh, two most common muscle groups that get injured in hockey, and that forms a majority of the injuries in, in, in the hip. Now that being said, about 10% of hip injuries or hip in, uh, injuries around the groin actually are interarticular or involve the hip joint, whether it's due to arthritis or impingement. So the differential diagnosis, if you have a patient that comes in complaining of groin pain or hip pain, the first two, hip flexor and adductors, are the two most common. The, the other ones like osteitis pubis, sports hernia, hernias, etc., uh, those are much more minor but uh, need, to be, uh, need to be considered. Um, and the interarticular pathology, we talk about labral tears and, uh, and femoral osteoporosis impingement. Reasons for hip injuries, it's fairly obvious. It's a fairly high demand on the hip. Uh, it's a contact sport. It's, it's the same maneuver over and over and over again. Uh, and it's, it's freaking cold. Um, <laughs> so in particular in hockey, what are the at-risk positions? An abducted and externally rotated position. You see Char there getting kind of tackled by, I don't know, I think it was one of the lightning. And the flexed and internally rotated position. Now this is the, the, the position that hockey goalies adopt nowadays. This is uh, popularized by Patrick Waugh. And you see the, the picture on the right shows us doing what's called the impingement test. We're testing for impingement or fair loss or impingement. And if you notice, it's the same exact position there as these hockey goalies are, are, are attempting to get into. So hockey goalies are keeping me in business. Um, the normal anatomy of the hip, it's, it should be, you want good coverage. So the hip is a ball and joint socket. You want not too much coverage. You want not too little coverage. You want the sort of the perfect amount of coverage. And the most important thing about the hip really is the cartilage inside. That's the stuff that we cannot save. That's the stuff that leads to arthritis. And that's the stuff that we're trying to prevent from getting worse. So looking at the hip anatomy, um, the cartilage is, is this white stuff right there. The labrum is this structure sitting right there. And we hear a lot now about labral tears and labral injuries. And what I want to stress about the labrum is the labrum is like a canary. Once it actually is torn and once it's actually injured, the cartilage underneath has already been damaged to some degree. And that's the important part. Like I said, the, the whole entire joint, any joint, it's the cartilage. It's not the bone, it's the cartilage. It's not the labrum, it's the cartilage. And that's the stuff we're trying to save. So trying to do things to help prevent cartilage damage and cartilage injury, hip injuries, is, is, is our goal. So again, like I said, adductor tendinopathy is a significant uh, muscle injury that, that occurs in hockey. Um, and it usually is due to a difference in the strength of the muscles. So one of the things that you're going to hear us say is, we like muscles to be strong, but we want them to be supple and be able to be stretched out. Um, hip flexor and groin strains, the, the adductor or the, uh, the psoas, is the, 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 the second most, or actually the most common, the actors is really the second. And in particular, hip flexor and groin strains, those are things that can be treated with rest, anti-inflammatories, and in particular, physical therapy. And so if you see that they're not getting better with those modalities, then you have to start thinking, is it inside the joint or, or something structural? So that brings us to the next point. Is it a groin injury or is it a hip injury? So again, if they fail conservative management, start thinking it's, it's inside the hip. It could be a labral tear, it could be femoral osteoporosis impingement, and that's where you start referring them 
to uh, uh, other, you know, um, practitioners who will get x-rays, MRIs, et cetera, if we suspect things. Um, again, so what is impingement? Uh, this is the classic slide that shows impingement. This is the socket here. Here's the ball. And you want, again, good coverage, not too much, not too little. If you have, so if you, um, if you look at, this is the socket, and the socket is extended over in the front. That's called a pincer uh, lesion. If the ball isn't round, as in this part, that's called a cam lesion. And if you have, a, you can have mixed uh, impingement as well, which is probably the most common form. Impingement occurs where you get a loss of internal rotation of the hip with, and in particular with flexion and adduction. That picture we showed where we flexed, adducted, and internally rotated, that's the impingement sign. If you get pain in that position, it, is, um, it signifies that there may be something going on with the rotation of the hip. Um, the reason it's important is because there's a fairly high prevalence, particularly in hockey, um, of, of kids, of asymptomatic kids having femoral lost tablet impingement. So the one thing that I would like to stress is if you have a kid whose internal rotation of his hip doesn't move that well, and we will talk about this, don't try to push him. Don't try to, try to crank on him and say, yes, I'm going to try to get more internal rotation for you. There may be a reason why they don't have that movement. And if you try to crank on them, that's when you can start causing injuries. So the problem with, the, with impingement is that the bump or this overcoverage causes um, uh, uh, repetitive contact and that can cause cartilage damage as well as labral tears which can lead, then lead to arthritis. So how do, we start, how do we start to evaluate this? We start to look at the patient as a whole. And this is okay, thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Nikki. And this is our wonderful patient. <laughs> this is Glenn Wellman. Want to take your shoes off, Glenn? Please. And Glenn, Glenn was a hockey goalie. And can you take your socks off, please? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the first part of any assessment should really just, just be to look at the athlete. Uh, I think one can uh, really tell a lot by just looking at the posture from the anterior view, the posterior view, and the lateral view. Ruth talked a lot about alignment and dance. Alignment is important in any sport. If, you have, if you're in perfect alignment and everything is centered over your center of gravity, whether you're standing on two foot or, or one foot, you will never be injured. So the body likes to be centered. So when we look at, we, when we look at posture, we want to check is the head centered over the, the pubic synthesis? Are his shoulders level? He looks pretty good. We want to look at the waist fold. Sometimes if there's a scoliosis, you'd see a, a fullness on one side, and you'd see an increased waist fold on one side and a fullness on the other. And if you look at the distance between his arm and his waist, he looks pretty good. We get down to his hips, and you want to just check and see. I always like to stand behind them and see, it. Are, is the pelvis level? Is one tilted, is one high, is one forward, etc. Now, when we come down to his knees, he's got a little bit of errors. Uh, actually, he's got quite a bit of errors, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think we really have to worry about that because the knees are smack dab in the middle. When you have problems with the knees, you can have problems upstairs and you can have problems downstairs. So the next thing we want to look at is feet. His feet don't look too bad, but let's look at him from uh, let's look at him from the side. When we look at it from the side. We want to look at the posterior curvature in the thoracic spine and the anterior curvature. Does he have increased lordosis? Oftentimes, especially in dancers, I work with dancers, but I've seen it also. If someone is standing in a lot of hyperlordosis, we have to think, are their hip flexors tight? What are they doing to all of the other structures? You, oftentimes you see hyperlordosis, you see tightness in the hip flexors, and you see hyperextension of the knees. And we talked a lot about knees today. He doesn't look too bad. He looks like he's got a normal amount. Let's look at him from the, from the rear. From the rear, again, we want to look and see level of the pelvis, and you can actually really see the varus of the knees from the rear. While you're looking at posture, we can just check. Just by having him stand on one leg, we can see if the gluteus medius is weak. If he can stand on one leg and not drop his hip. So let's see what happens when he stands on his right leg. That looks pretty good. Do you see any drop in the pelvis? No, how about on the left side? So that, so he's in pretty good shape, but I do worry about his knees, and we'll get to that in a minute. And I'm going to turn over the next. So you can learn a lot by the posture. I'm a little concerned about perhaps some of the tightness he might have around the knee, and also some of the tightness he might have around the hip. And the other thing we really want to always check on any athlete, and I don't think we talked about it enough today, are the abdominals. 
The abdominals are the chief support of the back, and when you have strong abdominals, you, you will probably minimize a lot of hip injuries. And I'll turn it over to Steve now. Okay, hi. Um, do a couple of screening things here. Um, works quite well. What we usually start with is internal external rotation of the hip, both in a seated position and in uh, prone or supine. I'll demonstrate it in prone, because uh, that's more of what I'm used to. Uh, we had a nice we had a half nice hour thing. argument the other day over which was better, but uh, it was an argument for the betterment of the patient. Um, so I'm going to have Glenn sit here for me, go ahead and face that direction. I apologize for turning my back to you. Go ahead and sit up. Um, what we've done in the past with screening large numbers of athletes is we'll actually let them sit against something here. So we'll find some sort of structure that's about this, this long here, and we'll allow their lumbar spine to actually sit directly against it. And in a large group, if you're screening that many, a team, for example, um, that may be the best way to, to normalize it as best as we can in a uh, somewhat subjective situation here. So I've got a little uh, app on my iPhone here. Uh, it's called Clinometer. Best 99 cents I ever spent. Uh, you can also go the old-fashioned way here. So if I've got him, I'm going to put this goniometer directly lined up on the medial border of his tibia, and then I'm just going to passively, again, his back is supported, so I just want to be clear about that. I'm just going to passively internally rotate him. And again, we're not forcing it. I can get a ton here. I can get 42 degrees, but that's not real. We have to watch when the pelvis engages. I'm going to get up right here. Right there, right there. Right about there. I, I see, see his ASIS popping up. He's got about 28 degrees. You, did you stretch today? This is more than you have. <laughs> All right. From the same position. I think he got nervous. We practiced the other night. <laughs> from the same position, I can go into external rotation here, and he's got about 30 degrees. But again, over time and experience, I've learned that you can't just pop this up. Otherwise, you're going to get winking of the, uh, the pelvis there, and you really have to get a good solid read without any extra force. Range of motion should always be taken passively. I know sometimes you'll see people saying that active, and if that's active, that's just functional range of motion. Range of motion should always be passive. For the prone model, uh, I'm going to have you lay down your stomach, please, Glenn. Okay. Lay down. Sure. So, and so um, oh, I think one thing, again, what I would re completely reiterate what Mickey just said. It's, it's passive range of motion. And what we are looking for is what we call impingement free range of motion, where it's right where uh, Steve was saying, oh, the ASIS is starting to, you know, kind of wink or move. That's where it stops. Um, you, you know, as you, as you do more and more, you'll get a feeling. You, you know, Steve was able to crank him out to 40 degrees, but at that point, his pelvis is completely rocked the other way. So it, his pelvis has to be stable, and you feel the end range, and it's really only about 20 degrees in, in Glenn. Exactly. Same thing here. I can take him and I can internally rotate him all the way out to here. He's at about 50 degrees, maybe 60 degrees. But that's not real. So we get him in this position. Sorry, bud. In this position here, got him nicely lined up. Keep an eye on his glutes here as they pop up. That's it. That's what he's got. In clodometer, medial border, 22, 23 degrees. So he's got a little bit less prone and in a short seated position. So the to me, message that here is he can't be a dancer. Probably not. <laughs> to me this tells me he may have a little bit extra tightness in his hip flexion to go along with uh, any type of capsular tightness that may be, issue, uh, that may be an issue as well. So um, 90 degrees, you really get that bony end feel. If they do have a cam or a pincer impingement, you get them in this position here, we're getting a little bit more soft tissue as a restriction. And you know, you do this enough, you get a feel for whether it's a spongy end feel or a hard end feel as well. But to, to start off with, you really just want to get that nice passive. There it is right there, 22. External, same idea. But again, he's going to pop up right yeah, he's there. He's popping up, yeah. Now he's not relaxed. Come on. Uh, <laughs> well, he's popping right up there. even sooner. <laughs> so that's going to be our internal external rotation in a uh, prone. Um, if you want to do quick measurements, if you're screening a ton of people, uh, just do a Faber's test. Measure the knee to the table. That's going to get a little bit of an external little bit of induction as well. But that's one way to get it with just a tape measure and not a fancy app or anything like that. So uh, what's next here? Hip flexion. Go ahead and flip over, please, Glenn. Sure. So this is another thing I've used in the past, uh, screening hockey teams uh, and other student athletes as well. I will demonstrate here. Very simple. Again, this is very so this is like kinesiology 101, but I think executing it properly is, is where it becomes useful 
consistent data. If I've got a hand underneath his back, I can just take him passively. Bam, there it is. I can feel his lumbar spine, his erector spine, and his spinous process. He's popped down into my hands right there. That's not even nutty, so that's worse than Friday. But um, it's got about 90 degrees of hip flexion directly in the sagittal plane. Come out to the side, which I'll touch on later. We might get a little bit more. But right there, that's about 90 degrees, 85, 90 degrees of hip flexion. Um, so if I take Glenn and I tell him to put a bar on his back and load, his, load him up and then drop down below 90, he's not going to do that without, without the... Uh, we will do that at the expense of some other tissues. So, um, just a screening point there. Oh, and it's also important to note, you start thinking about in making inferences to yourself on what it is that's causing that. Why can't Glenn get past 90? Is it an anterior issue? Does he have an impingement issue? Does he have a capsular tightness issue? On the posterior side, is it a length tension issue? Are his glutes uh, piriformis, any of those structures? So. You start teasing out whether it's an uh, anterior internal problem, whether it's more of a posterior length tension issue um, as you go. And you start putting this data together with the internal external rotation, along with what he looks like in a squat pattern. You start start piecing together the whole clinical picture of what Glenn's hips look like. So Nikki will start to touch on, like, well, how do you figure out, is it due to his psoas? Is it due to his um, rectus, et cetera? Yeah, I think one of the things that, that um, has really bothered me about, why don't you scoot up a little bit more so you okay. Is that lots of, lots of these high level athletes are doing a lot of strength training, but they're not doing a lot of flexibility. And I think one of the biggest problems that we're having is that imbalance between flexibility and strength. And I think it's, it's bad to do too much flexibility and not enough strength, but it's the same thing vice versa. And when I was evaluating uh, uh, Glenn, I was really concerned about how tight his iliopsoas is, which is really tight, and also his hamstrings and his calf. And if you think about hockey, and he was a goalie, they're always in the squat, they're in the squat position a lot, and especially a goalie, they're really way down there. So I think that we really want to see how tight he is. To properly do the Thomas test, why don't you bend both? Okay, can you hold this leg? I really should be on this side. Uh, hold this, uh, uh, yeah, hold this leg. Mm -hmm. And I, it is very important that this test be done passively. And I'm going to try to do it so that you can see what I'm doing. It's very important that you have your hand on the ASIS. A lot of people do this test incorrectly. They'll just take the leg and they'll say, oh, oh, that's not bad. No, they say that's good. It's, you know, it's about 20 degrees, but that's not the case. If I Okay, I got my hand on his ASIS, and he's got to be completely relaxed. He's got to trust me. He's got to let this leg go dead. Just let it go. Let it go. Okay. Come on, now watch my thumb. Watch my thumb. As soon as my thumb rocks forward, that's where the test is stopped. So watch my thumb very carefully. Tell me when. Right there. And if I measure that tightness here. Can anybody guess what that is? 35. <laughs> okay. So he's very, very tight here. The other thing is if I go to do a straight leg raise, and I, I just want you to know, know that I got the Thomas test from H.O. Thomas' original book at the Harvard um, Rare Books Library, 1876, Liverpool. So that's how you do the test, according to Thomas. And, and you would record it as a plus 35 degrees, so that that would be your baseline, so we would get him on a good stretching program, and hopefully when he comes back in two weeks, when, when you come back in two weeks, he's gonna gain about 20 degrees. The other thing is the straight leg raise. Again, you have to keep your eye on the pelvis. Watch this, as soon as, as, soon as that pelvis moves, I'm gonna stop the test. Look at that, see where it's moving? Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Jeez, he's now, tight. Now, lots of people would say, oh, he can get it up higher. But look at what happens when we get it up higher. So basically, right there, so this young man is an accident waiting to happen, OK? <laughs> that is a just not even quite a 30 degree straight leg raise. But what really bothers me, which is even bothering me even more, is the popliteal angle. 
When I have his, split, his hip flexed at 90 degrees and I try to straighten this knee, that's it. So he's been playing a lot of hockey, but he's not been doing a lot of stretching. So I'm a little bit concerned about that. <laughs> the other thing is, everybody talks about the um, iliotibial band, the uh, tightness in the uh, tensor fascia latte. You, there is no way that you can do an over test with a positive Thomas test, and I'll explain why. I'll just demonstrate. I can't do it on him, but I'll demonstrate why I can't do it on him. Can you turn over on your side? No, on this side. Okay, come way over here towards me, way over. Can you bend this knee? Come into a ball. In order to really do a proper over test, and that's by Dr. Frank Ober, who worked at Children's Hospital and taught us all during the polio epidemics how to do, not me, but my boss, how to do uh, an over test. The leg has to be completely relaxed, completely relaxed. And in order to really do it, the hip has to be forward. You have to be able to flex, abduct, and fully extend so that the tensor fascia lata moves over the greater trochanter. There's no way. He's got a positive Thomas test of 35 degrees. But does he have a tight iliotibial band? I gotta tell you, and I'm gonna show you a quick way to look at it, even though it's not a true test. If I have him, why don't you just um, scoot down to the edge of the table? Okay, just remember, I want your hips way down. Here. Yeah. And then just lie down. Okay. Just bring just bring both your legs up. Hang hold on to this leg. Just drop this leg. <laughs> so you can tell he's got a tight rectus because this is popping up. His hip isn't really quite on the table and his, he's arching his back so he's got a tight iliopsoas. But look at what's happening to his leg, it's abducting. So right away we probably do know, even though I can't do an over test on him, it's a good bet with this amount of tightness. He's got tightness in his hip flexors, hamstrings, TFL, and we need to get him on a very good stretching program including his entire hockey team. <laughs> We're going to send them to ballet. <laughs> okay, next. So um, we, we can go over the stretches really quick, quickly, about five minutes. Um, the big thing in, in terms of Glenn is that, you know, like Mickey said, he's an accident waiting to happen. So what we want to do is really get him uh, into a stretching program. Uh, these are just easy stretches you can do for the iliopsoas, um, stretches for the hamstring, and stretches for the rectus and for the iliotibial band. Um, we will have all the stuff. If you guys want a handouts and stuff like that, or if you want the, the, these actual uh, pictures, just email Steve, and, uh, and, and, and we have a PDF of everything we can send you um, uh, for this. But in the interest of time, we're going to go on to some strengthening. Actually, yeah, okay. So, um, Glenn, lay on your side here, please. I'm just going to show you this real quick. Something we've done in the past at Northeastern. Um, it's not quite as applicable in the clinical setting when cost is a bit of an issue because this handheld dynamometer is probably $800 or $1,000, but um, the Tim Tyler study in early 2000s, uh, Dr. Yen referenced it earlier, showed us that a uh, less than 80% adduction strength to abduction puts uh, hockey players at a 17 times greater risk for groin strains, which of course is the hockey injury, right? Um, so a quick way to measure that is with this. I'm not going to say everybody needs a handheld dynamometer. It's certainly cool to have. It's fun if you know how to turn it on. There we go. Um, what we can do is just basic right out of the, uh, the manual muscle testing book. We're going to take an abduction. I won't go through the whole thing, but we can do a straight abduction, measure three. You can average it, take the best one, take, take whichever one feels like it's a solid test, as well as the adduction. So go ahead and bend your knee. <laughs> Straighten this guy here, put this leg over. So we would get him in this position to do the adduction. Um, again, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but we want 80% abduction to adduction, and we want within, I think it's 90% strength left to right bilaterally uh, as a nice indicator of general hip muscle health. So that's for the, uh, the handheld dynamometer. So, you know, it, it's, you know, as Mickey has alluded to, you know, core strengthening, you know, um, particularly in regards to uh, abdominal strength and pelvic stability is of critical importance to help prevent injuries. So, you know, not only do we have to do this, you know, again, it comes back to the muscles need to be strong, yet they need to be supple and stretched out. 
And so you have to combine a good strengthening program with a good stretching program. And the abdominal, it all starts with the abdomen. It all starts with the core. Do we have time for the abdominals? Yeah, well, let's just do, let's do a couple. How about glute meat and glute meat and one abdominal, and then we can kill it. Do you want to do the glute meat? Sure, sure. Again, basically what we're trying to say overall picture is identify a weakness, identify an imbalance, and then use your tools. Everybody in this room knows how to do a, a lateral raise or a clamshell. Or not a clamshell. Um, I hate the, the clamshell, and I'll tell you why. This was studied in JOSPT uh, article a couple years ago. There's a good EMG study there. I can't remember the last name with it. And then you can go through your standard mini band series here. Um, band just goes around your knees. Standing here, you can go into a walking pattern, just really targeting the glute meat, a backwards walking pattern, a lateral walking, whatever it is you choose to do. Um, it's it's pretty uh, pretty good for hitting that glute medius muscle. Okay. Quickly, just to go over the abdominals, because I can't ever give a lecture on the hip without talking about the abdominals, and I've been very <coughs> upset about not hearing the abdominals all morning. So I think the big thing is we have to test the abdominals. Now, if you look at, at Glenn, he looks fantastic. He looks like he's in great shape, and just on the about on the posture, it looks like he's got you know, good abdomen. I wish I could look like him. But he, if we, we ch I'll just show you quickly the upper abdominals. Bend your, bend, bend your knees. Okay, just like this. Put your hands. For a normal test, he's got to be able to keep his back, the low back in contact with the table. He's got to be able to clear his shoulder blades without bringing his arms in. So let's see if he can do that. He does that beautifully. So he's got really, I would say, normal upper abdominals. To do the obliques, same thing, I would instruct the patient to come up uh, um, center, but then when they rotate, they have to, it's, uh, lots of patients come up too high, and that's not good. He has to just clear his shoulder blades, and then he must rotate towards me and not let this shoulder blade touch the table. So I'm going to have him do it himself. Perfect. Can you do it on the other side? Yeah. Okay. Is your neck bothering you? No. Okay. So, he, so his internal and external, and they really, I mean, they feel fantastic. <laughs> On the other hand, <laughs> and I, I treat a lot of young dancers, and I, I know this is hockey, but I have to tell you that almost all of the young dancers I treat right now, between the ages of 11 and 16, and all the young men that I treat, young athletes, I work with mostly young adolescents, not, not big guys like this guy, none of them pass this test. They all have weak lower abdominals. Now, okay, we start with my hand under his lumbar spine, and I tell him to crush my fingers, crush my fingers. That's it. Pull that stomach in. Straighten your legs as much as possible. Don't worry about it because I know the hamstrings are tight. You can keep them <laughs> separate there. Okay, and I do the Kendall and Kendall leg lowering test. And I, I always say to uh, my patients, this is not an exercise. You are never to do this. This is a test. And he is, and I instruct him that as soon as he feels his lumbar spine leave my hand, he, he has to stop the test. Right now, he's having a hard time holding it up. This is in the poor category. He's got to drop it down at least 15 or 20 degrees to get it into the fair category. Okay, hold it up there. Now start to lower. Right there. That's how weak he is. He, he lifted right off right there. So in addition to his stretching, he has to strengthen his core. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, uh, so we, we need to wrap up. Um, essentially, you know, uh, what we've said is we you have to sort of you have to provide a comprehensive evaluation to identify and you know and reduces risk factors. Yeah, early problem recognition is critical, and you, um, if if you suspect a problem, seek advice of you know of an orthopedic surgeon. Um, and the biggest thing that we have to reiterate is you want to balance. Flexibility with strength, and that's the key to preventing injuries. Flexibility with good strength. Thanks. Can we take a minute to thank Glenn for being our session?